Thank you, Franz, and I uh, appreciate very much this invitation to speak to you, and thank you all for coming out on this uh, day when you could be outside. I appreciate you spending and uh, dedicating your time to this somewhat obscure subject, but I hope uh, to bring it alive to you a little bit. Uh, Augustine's decade as a Manichaean had culminated in his opportunity to spend time in the company of Faustus of Milium, the regional leader of the Manichaean church. This encounter affected Augustine in a number of profound ways, which I've outlined in some previous publications. But their time together was cut short by Augustine's departure from Africa in 383 CE. He returned to Africa four years later a Catholic Christian, having been converted and baptized in Milan and rose rapidly in the leadership of the still fledgling Catholic Church of North Africa. He alluded with ambivalence to Faustus in several of his early compositions, but openly named Faustus for the first time in the famous Confessions. Confessions is a work of great complexity and a number of puzzling features, not the least of which is its portrayal of Faustus. It is likely that Augustine felt free to name Faustus because the Manichaean was now dead. Before then, Augustine probably considered himself honor bound not to bandy about the names of individuals who could be prosecuted under the anti-Manichaean laws on the basis of what he reported of their role in the Manichaean organization. But Augustine did more than simply retell the story of his intellectual exchanges with Faustus. He turned Faustus into a character that served his narrative purposes casting him as a simple and unsophisticated man of natural gifts who had found his way to a kind of piety and to celibacy despite being mired in heresy. In this way, Faustus served alongside of other characters in Confessions, such as Augustine's mother, Monica, to highlight Augustine's personal failing as someone who allowed his intellectual pride to stand in the way of his conversion and moral reform. No doubt Augustine thought that with Faustus safely dead, he could tell his story as he pleased, bending the truth for his literary purposes. But Faustus proved to have an afterlife that Augustine could not control. Before his death, Faustus had composed a work known simply as The Chapters, or perhaps the, uh, a lengthier title, uh, built around that, that main title chapters. These are a collection of arguments to be used in debate with those Faustus called semi-Christians. That is, those who differed with the true and full Christianity of Manichaeism. It seems that some readers of Confessions recognize the name Faustus as that of the author of this polemical collection and brought it to the attention of Augustine, who previously had been unaware of its existence. It must have caused him some embarrassment, because the Faustus who spoke in it was far from the uneducated, simple figure portrayed in Confessions. Here was a man of sophistication and intellectual depth, who posed incisive challenges to key weak points of Catholic belief and practice. Augustine felt compelled to respond and produced a very lengthy rebuttal, the Counter Faustum, in which he quoted, Faustus, he quoted Faustus on each point and then answered him to defend Catholic Christianity from the charge of being merely a semi-Christianity. Now, when we have a text like this, which has been fully known since the time Augustine wrote it, never been lost, has been studied and commented on many times, the challenge is always to find something new to say and my approach in my work is simply to peel back the layers of interpretation which were framed within certain assumptions and to try to escape those assumptions, uh, particularly uh, in terms of the assumptions of those who have read it within a context of the victory of Catholic Christianity over Manichaeism. And when we come to the works of Augustine, when he engages with Manichaeism, the natural tendency is to assume Augustine always wins his arguments, always has the good arguments, that his reasoning is always a solid reasoning, and that an opponent like Faustus is someone who is, does not have uh, successful arguments, 
who does not score good points, uh, whose uh, arguments can be ridiculed and mocked in the way that Augustine so persuasively portrays them. And so I see my task as to give a kind of counter reading in which we give Faustus's arguments as much credit as I think they are due and see it as a more of an equal debate with strengths and weaknesses on both sides. And that's the reading I will try to give you uh, today. So this is a representation of Faustus and, and Augustine up here. And in this particular portrait, Faustus is the one uh, wearing the bishop's uh, mitre. Uh, and, and Augustine is without. And we'll see that situation is reversed in another painting I'll put up here momentarily. So this would be Augustine still as a young Manichaean learning from Faustus as opposed to the sort of hypothetical debate situation that Augustine constructed in the Contra Faustum itself. Faustus raises many issues, or rather seems to be responding himself to a variety of issues raised about and against the Manichaeans for their nonconformity to Nicene Christian orthodoxy. There is nothing systematic about this material, either in subject or in sequence, even though several key themes are raised repeatedly, even redundantly. This disordered character of the chapters may provide a clue to the circumstances of its composition. Faustus had been arrested around 386 CE and tried for his role in leading the Manichaean community in North Africa, which was a crime under the, under the relatively new anti-heresy laws that had been issued following the establishment of the Catholic Church as the official religion of the Roman Empire. The proceedings of this trial may have provided Faustus an opportunity to hear and answer the kinds of questions and charges that form the framework for his chapters. He was found guilty and sentenced to life in exile on a small island. And it has been suggested that he may have composed the chapters during this enforced exile. Uh, several times he appears to quote or speak of a specific interlocutor who is clearly a Catholic, not a Donatist, even though Donatists had well outnumbered Catholics in North Africa for most of Faustus's public career. So he's responding specifically to the group in power and enforced by the government. His chapters could be based in part on a transcript of his answers during the trial or on notes he made during or after the trial about possible answers. The possible relationship of the chapters to Faustus's trial, therefore, may help to explain the apparent disarray of these capitula, combining redundancy of subject matter with no obvious grouping of related discussion. There is no reason to think Augustine has introduced this peculiar disorder of the text, since it frustrates the efficiency of Augustine's own argument, as he complains about quite often. It may well be, therefore, that Faustus never issued the chapters as a whole and finished work. He may have issued them as fascicles, much like Augustine's well-known 84 various questions. Or they may represent papers confiscated when he was sentenced, or by those supervising his exile, before he had time to put them in order, even though we do have a kind of introduction to the set that Faustus himself composed. In any case, while collectively the capitula reveal Faustus's thinking on the differences between Manichaean and Catholic positions, and his views on the semi-Christianity of the latter, they do not appear systematically designed to present that case, but rather return again and again to key issues that would be raised by Catholics in a trial of Manichaeans. Faustus at one point makes a creedal statement of his views as a Manichaean. And this is the statement here on the screen behind me. He says, quote, we worship the divinity of God, the almighty father, and of Christ, his son, and of the Holy Spirit, one and the same God under their three names. But we believe that the father himself inhabits the highest and principal light, which Paul elsewhere calls inaccessible, but that the Son resides in this, the second and visible light. Since the Son is himself twofold, as the Apostle knows, since he calls Christ the power of God and the wisdom of God, we believe that his power dwells in the Son, but his wisdom in the moon. And we confess that all the surrounding air is the abode of the Holy Spirit, who is the third majesty. And from his powers and spiritual outpouring, the earth also conceives and gives birth to the suffering Jesus who is the life and salvation of human beings hanging from every tree. 
For this reason, we have the same religious attitude regarding all things as you have regarding the bread and the cup. This is our faith. He goes on to identify the chief differences between Manichaean and Catholic Christianity to be the Catholic agreement with Jews and pagans in the idea of monarchia. That is the teaching that, quote, good and evil, the dark and the bright, the perpetual and the perishable, the changeable and the stable, the bodily and the divine have one principle, unquote. By contrast, the Manichaeans teach that, quote, God is the principle of all good things, unquote but that their evil opposites derive from a separate principle and nature of evil. Moreover, Catholic Christians carry over into their semi-Christianity the scriptures of the Jews and various superstitious rituals of the pagans. Again, to quote Faustus, you transform their sacrifices into agapes and their idols into martyrs whom you worship with similar prayers. You placate the shades of the dead with wine and meals. You celebrate the solemn feast days of the nations, such as the Kalans and the solstices, along with them. From their life, you've in fact changed nothing." Unquote. Faustus claims, in short, that Manichaeism is the only true Christianity, the one that completely breaks with traditional views and practices stemming from a pre-Christian culture. Now, when I showed you that creedal statement that Faustus gives, you might have recognized a superficial resemblance to the Nicene Creed in some of its structure and themes. And indeed, Faustus' Creed appears crafted to claim legitimacy for Manichaeans under the legal definition of the state religion in accord with the Nicene Constantinopolitan Creed. After all, the Manichaeans sided with Nicene Christians against the Arians on the question of the divinity of Christ. And Arius even charged that the key term homoousios had been borrowed from Manichaean theology. So this, of course, is the, is the Creed of Nicaea. Um, and this, of course, is the crucial passage in which the distinction from an Arian position was defined. And the Manichaeans actually fell on this side of the argument. They sided with uh, the Catholic position in terms of the pre-existence of Christ and the non-creaturely nation of Christ. So Manichaean could subscribe to the Nicene Creed uh, with, with no problems, no difficulties whatsoever. Constantinople, however, set up a certain challenge that Faustus now had to confront in terms of refining the Nicene Creed in a way that pushed some of the issues that now would force the Manichaeans to some degree, to dis be distinguished um, from uh, the, the Nicene Christians. And so in Constantinople, we have specific references to, uh, to uh, being incarnate by the Holy Spirit of the Virgin Mary. This is new language in Constantinople. The, the crucifixion and the burial and things like this, some of these are new elements in the Constantinople Creed that start to force apart where the Manichaeans and the Catholics otherwise were together. The specific reference to the Holy Spirit having spoken through the prophets of the Jewish scriptures was something that was not in the Nicene Creed. So the Constantinople version of the creed pushed certain, certain elements of these issues that split them apart. And so the rest of the chapters of Faustus are dominated by a few key points of nonconformity between the Manichaeans and Nicene doctrine as the Creed of Constantinople was now raising the issues. So these are, um, this is to highlight some of those key differences there. So one of the main themes of the chapters, therefore, is that Manichaeans do not accept the authority of the law and prophets of the Old Testament. The Nicene Creed had said nothing on this subject, but the Constantinople Creed does bring it up. Secondly, the Manichaeans do not accept the physical virgin birth of Jesus. Remember, the Nicene Creed said simply that Jesus came down and was incarnate and made man. Constantinople adds the, the Virgin Mary and so forth. Faustus makes these two issues the centerpiece of his argument that the Catholic position on them renders Catholics semi-Christians. Faustus charges that by accepting the Old Testament alongside the New and allowing it to influence how the message of Jesus is understood, Catholics have, quote, sewn a new patch on an old garment, 
unquote, and poured, or poured new wine into old wineskins. Therefore, as half Jewish, they are not fully Christians, as the Manichaeans are. With regard to insisting on the incarnation and physical humanity of Jesus, Faustus accuses the Catholics of displacing the teachings of Jesus for teachings about Jesus, which Jesus himself never taught. He adds to these two points a number of other observations of Catholic practice that he criticizes as essentially pagan in character, furthering the impression of an only semi-Christian church. Now let's look at each of these arguments in turn and how Augustine deals with them. It's important to remember that both Faustus and Augustine deliver rhetorical performances rather than rigorously logical or consistent analyses of the subjects they discuss. They both imagine themselves as debaters before an audience, seeking to dazzle with their cleverness and overwhelm their opponent with a barrage of alternative arguments that may or may not cohere in a consistent philosophical or interpretive position. They exploit any individual weakness in their opponent's position without concern for how an attack on it might come back to hurt their own positions. They at times pursue a line of argument to its logical end. And then with their opponent imagined to be crushed, admit that it is not actually their position, but one taken purely for the sake of argument. Along the way, each side reveals a certain amount about their true positions and the premises that underlie them. And some of these prove particularly interesting to us because they have significance beyond merely reporting a momentary, and again, artificial debate because they were not actually face to face in this debate. So the first point I want to take a closer look at is the semi-Christianity of accepting the Old Testament. And this is a fundamental dividing point between the Manichaeans and the Catholics. Manichaeism rejects the Old Testament as representative of a fundamentally different religion than Christianity. The sort of contrast Faustus makes has come naturally to many Christians through the centuries. The wrathful Yahweh of the Old Testament versus the merciful Father of the New. The elaborate Torah code of 613 commandments versus the new commandment of love, and so on. Augustine, like countless priests and ministers since, has to confront these contrasts with evidence of continuity of thought and purpose between the Old Testament and the New. And that means a kind of defense of the Old Testament against overly simplistic caricatures of its content. And given that necessity of defense of the Old Testament, it has been possible for some to suggest that Augustine is in some way defending Judaism and defending Jews against an anti-Semitic Faustus. So I think it is particularly important to show that neither part of that suggestion is correct. Faustus is no anti-Semite. And Augustine is, unfortunately, no defender of the Jews. Instead, and in here now, Augustine is the one who's dressed up fully as a bishop, and, and Faustus is in the subordinate position as the debate partner. So instead of, of doing the way Faustus has been caricatured uh, in some recent scholarship, scholarship that was intending to find something good in Augustine, find something worth uh, celebrating and praising in Augustine, and in that sense, very worthy, but I thought, I think has gone too far in terms of salvaging Augustine's reputation at the expense of Faustus's. What Faustus does in terms of the Christian relationship to Jews and Judaism is this. He highlights a great peculiarity of this semi-Christianity that he uses to describe the Catholic Church, namely, that it appropriates another religion's sacred scripture as its own. It does not share it with the other religion. It appropriates it, claiming that the Old Testament properly belongs to Christians, not Jews, and doesn't mean what the Jews take it to mean, but entirely supports Christian positions where they differ from Jewish ones. Faustus characterizes this fact as an act of religious aggression against the Jews and the property of their own tradition. He doesn't believe in Judaism himself or approve of it, and he doesn't see any indication that the Catholic Christians do either. So why steal away a book from a religion that you do not approve of and try to read it in a way that supports your religion? Faustus says, quote, we have learned from it and from the New Testament not to covet another's property. 
But what, you ask, does the Old Testament have that is others' property? Rather, what does it have that is not others' property? It promises riches and a full belly, children and grandchildren, a long life, and along with these, a kingdom in Canaan. But it promises all of this to the circumcised, to those who keep the Sabbath, who offer sacrifices, and who abstain from pork and other such things. Because I and every Christian regard these things as useless and irrelevant to the salvation of the soul, I recognize that what it promises is of no concern to me. And bearing in mind the commandment, you shall not cover others' property, I have gladly and willingly permitted the Jews to have what belongs to them, content, you may be sure, with the gospel and the splendid heritage of the kingdom of heaven. For I would rightly say to a Jew by way of reprimand, if he claimed the gospel for himself, wicked fellow, what do you have to do with the gospel since you do not keep its commandments? I fear the Jew would reprimand me in the same way if I held on to the Old Testament, whose commandments I disdain." Unquote. Faustus, in other words, reads the Old Testament the way that most of the Jews of his time did, literally. He notes their promises the land of Canaan to those who are circumcised and follow Torah and so on, such things as sacrifices, rules of kosher, observance of Sabbath and festivals. Quote, the Jews therefore firmly believed this because Moses taught it, and hence they thought that they should not even give a hearing to Christ when he stated things contrary to the law. In contrast, he says, quote, the largest part of the Christian heresies, and what is pertinent here, the Catholics, do not take care to observe any of those commandments of which Moses writes. If this does not stem from some error, but from the true teaching of Christ and his disciples, you must admit without qualification that Jesus and Moses taught contrary doctrines, and that the Jews did not believe in Christ precisely because they wanted to show their faith in Moses, unquote. Indeed, he notes that Paul faults the Galatians for wishing to enslave themselves for the old things of the law. The New Testament, on the other hand, promises the kingdom of heaven and eternal life for those who follow the commandments of Christ, which do not involve such specific Torah-based practices. Faustus charges that it is hypocritical to claim the Old Testament and yet refuse to carry out its commandments. Quote, if then you ask what the difference is between your faith and mine, it is that you choose to lie and to act like a slave by praising in words what you hate in your mind." Unquote. Faustus admits he could not make the same argument to Jewish Christians, of which he was, with whom he is familiar, because they are consistent in accepting the idea that Jesus fulfills the law as the Gospel of Matthew says, and they themselves continue to observe the law as Jewish Christians. But, he says, Catholics can claim no such consistency. So then Faustus goes on to compare Catholic Christians to, quote, a lewd girl, forgetful of chastity, who enjoys the gifts and writings of another man, namely the Jewish God. But he points out how foolish they are, since even this would-be lover's faithful wife, the Jewish people, have not received what he promised them even though they, quote, go along with him in everything and serve him more submissively than a serving girl, unquote. Rather than living long and prosperous lives in their promised land, they are dispersed among the nations, suffering at their hands. Combine, combining the metaphor of pouring new wine into old wineskins with the Catholic claim to fulfill, that is, fill up the law and the prophets, Faustus says the Jews are already filled up by the Old Testament of Moses, and so logically reject the New Testament, just as the Manichaeans, full of the New Testament, reject the Old. He points out that, quote, the law and the prophets do not admit of fulfillment. They are considered, considered so full and complete that their author and father is angered by an addition to them, no less than by subtraction from them, unquote. If the Catholics really took seriously the authority of the Old Testament, he says, if you believed all these things and firmly held that God commanded them, believe me, you would have been the first to lay hands upon Christ and would not now be angry at the Jews, who in persecuting him mentally and physically fulfilled the commandment of their God." Unquote. The Catholic Christians, however, accept both the Old Testament and the New Testament because, quote, you are full of neither of them but half full of each, and hence semi-Christians. If you pour together different things that are not of the same kind, he warns, this is not called filling, but adulterating. 
Augustine supports Christian ownership of the Old Testament by claiming that its true meaning is a symbolic one. From the beginning, the Bible aimed forward to the coming of Christ and the Catholic Church, he argues. Every commandment, every story has a symbolic fulfillment in Christian doctrine and practice. Quote, in that way, not only the tongues of those men, but also their lives were prophetic, unquote. And another quote, they were symbols of realities and they were observed so that their very observance would be a prophecy that Christ was to come. The ancient Jews were not wrong to perform the prescribed rituals and observances literally, he says, but even their performance of them had significance only as signs for future Christian fulfillment. The surface mean of the commandments was appropriate to the hard-heartedness of the Jews, he contends, but at the same time had symbolic meaning for Christ. That is why Paul says that scripture speaks for our sake and, quote, these were all symbols of us. And so Augustine insists that, quote, it is indeed wrong for us not to read what was written for our sake, for it was written more for the sake of us for whom it has been revealed than for, for the sake of those for whom it was hidden in symbols, unquote. In this sense, Augustine says, the Old Testament was never theirs. It was always ours. Sometimes Augustine differentiates between Old Testament commandments that regulate and have continued actual application and those that symbolize and are no longer to be carried out. Paul faulted the Galatians for wanting to continue to perform circumcision after its true symbolic meaning had been revealed. At other times, however, Augustine insists that every single commandment, indeed every single verse, symbolize either Christ or the institutions of the Christian church. Everything that Moses wrote is about Christ, he says. The worldly promises made to the Jews that Faustus cites, Augustine believed actually referred symbolically to Christian realities. The promised land is really the kingdom of God, for instance. It is interesting to note that Augustine believes the same thing of the gospel narrative in the New Testament. The details of the stories of Jesus all have symbolic meaning beyond their surface sense. The Manichaeans were willing to employ a very sim similar symbolic interpretation of the New Testament and believed that Mani had the unique ability to decode its meaning. And Augustine remarks on this. But they excluded the Old Testament from this interpretive approach, treating it literally and rejecting its authority accordingly. When it comes to treating the Old Testament as a prophecy of Jesus, Faustus thinks that any such prophecy would seem to be rather beside the point once Jesus has come and the prophecy is fulfilled. Naturally, if it is a matter of winning Jews over to Christianity by showing how their own prophets foretold him, that's a fine thing, Faustus thinks. But he notes that he and the vast majority of Christians converted not from Judaism, but from paganism, for whom the Jewish prophets hold no authority. Quote, we are Gentiles by birth. That is what Paul calls the uncircumcised, people born under another law with other prophets, whom the Gentiles call seers. And we were afterwards converted from them to Christianity, unquote. For this reason, he says, even if the testimonies of the Hebrews should be true, they are useless before we have faith and are superfluous for us after we have faith, unquote. In any case, Faustus examines the Christian claim that the Old Testament contains prophecies of Jesus and finds Jews quite reasonable in their conclusion that it does not. With great rhetorical flourish, he states how happy he would be if someone could point such <coughs> prophecies out to him. He would be happy to take such good things from the Jewish scriptures, leaving aside the rest. But such passages as are typically cited, such as Deuteronomy 18.18 on a prophet like Moses, can scarcely be about Jesus. Faustus says, Jesus is not a man, he's not a sinner, he's not punished by God as Moses was, and so forth. And statements or prophecies made about everyone or a group of people cannot be cited because they happen to coincide with something Jesus did or experienced when they apply equally to others. On the other hand, Faustus can think of several passages from the New Testament where Jesus relied on God's direct testimony to him or asserted his testimony to himself or proofs of his works rather than making use of Old Testament prophecy to legitimate himself. Augustine offers no direct answer to Faustus's argument that Old Testament prophecy of Christ is now superfluous. And he acknowledges that Faustus has ingeniously sewn up his position by saying he would be happy to accept any Old Testament prophecies of Jesus without feeling obliged to accept the Old Testament as a whole. 
But Augustine thinks that the proof from prophecy is one of the strongest persuasions Christianity brings to winning converts and has been directly responsible for its success among the Gentiles. Even a Gentile would be persuaded of the validity of Jewish prophets, he asserts, by the fact that their prophecies have come true. It is even an advantage, he suggests, that the prophecies are preserved by the Jews, whose hostility to Christianity keeps them above suspicion of altering them to suit a Christian interpretation. As for the failure of the Jews themselves to see the Christian meaning of their scriptures, this too, Augustine believes, was foretold, and he cites some passages from Isaiah to that effect. The proof that Moses and Christ do not stand in opposition, as Faustus claims they do, comes from the wide success of a religion that combines them, such that, quote, we should rather be amazed at and blame the hard-heartedness of the Jews who did not do what we see the whole world is doing, unquote. Yet Augustine himself struggles to find very clear and obvious prophecies fulfilled in Christ, offering examples requiring a symbolic rather than literal reading to have come true, and indulging in some remarkably non-contextual exegesis. His attempt to prove how Christ is a prophet like Moses is a painful case in point. Augustine would seem to have a fairly easy task of supplying Faustus with any number of Old Testament prophecies that Christians before and after him took to be predictions of Jesus. He provides a few examples from the Gospels of Jesus himself saying there are such prophecies and of symbolic interpretations of Torah law suggested by Paul and insists that such prophecies are too numerous to cite. But, he, but when he proceeds to attempt a few examples of his own, his tendency to allegorical fantasy runs away with him and he proceeds to find Jesus alluded to in every story and every detail of Genesis. He faults, he faults Faustus, however, for selectively citing from John those places where Jesus gives testimony for himself while rejecting passages in the same gospel where Jesus cites prophetic testimony to him. Now turning to a different topic that Faustus spends time on, this is um, how Manichaeans uh, take an approach to the New Testament that is remarkably similar to some aspects of modern biblical criticism. The complaint uh, of Augustine about how Manichaeans handle the New Testament brings to the foreground one of the distinctive features of Manichaean handling of the biblical text, namely an approach that on the surface in any way looks like modern biblical criticism involving both text criticism, uh, source criticism, redaction criticism, all of these elements can be found in what Faustus brings to his discussion of the New Testament. For example, Faustus says that it is evident that many works of the New Testament were not written by Jesus' disciples, but a long time later by men whose names are uncertain. He says, quote, they were afraid that they would not be believed. Hence, at times, they put the names of the apostles on the first pages of their writings, unquote. And because of this, quote, they ascribe to them the discrepant and self-contradictory things that they wrote, unquote. For example, the lack of agreement between the genealogies of Jesus in the Gospels. Therefore, Faustus concludes, the narrative frame of the Gospels is unreliable and has nothing to do with what is core and essential to the Gospel. The beginning of the Gospel, as Mark says, comes with Jesus beginning his preaching. But even what is reported of this preaching must be scrutinized. Faustus says it is wrong to insist on belief in something, quote, because Christ said it, unquote, when whether or not he said it is precisely in question. According to Faustus, the gospel is, quote, nothing but the preaching and precept of Christ, unquote. The Manichaeans then are what we might call red letter Christians, as the current term is, based on modern Bibles that print Jesus' words in red. Jesus' direct instruction has supreme authority over any context or comment wrapped around it in the Gospels. We believe Christ unconditionally, Faustus asserts, but a Gospel writer does not merit such unquestioning faith. When Jesus calls for faith, he does not mean a faith without judgment or reason, Faustus insists. The possibility that the Gospel writers may even have invented sayings of Jesus, of course, complement, complicates things even further. Quote, because in reading them, we ourselves have noticed this with the perfectly sound gaze of our heart, we have judged it entirely just to accept from them what is useful, 
that is, those things that build up our faith and that spread the glory of Christ the Lord and of Almighty God, and to reject the other things that do not fit with their majesty or with our faith, unquote. As an example, Faustus examines Matthew's claim that Jesus said he came not to destroy the law, but to fulfill it. Notably, he treats Matthew like an ordinary human witness. He points out that Matthew had not yet joined the company of Jesus at the time when Jesus is reported to have made this statement. Yet John is reported to have been present at that time, but says nothing in his own gospel about Jesus saying it. So by the logic of ordinary witness testimony, John is to be accepted as the one on the scene at the time who would have quoted it if Jesus had said it. Matthew, having not been present at that time, would not be in a position to know, so his word is only hearsay. He also observes such things that are commonplaces of sort of popular barroom biblical debate as the fact that Matthew refers to himself in the third person in his gospel, suggesting it was written by someone other than Matthew, and so forth. So Faustus explains the Manichaean faith has convinced me not to believe indiscriminately all the things we read were written under the name of the Savior, but to test whether they are true, sound, and incorrupt. For there are many weeds that the sower of the night has scattered in almost all the scriptures in order to spoil the good seed. But you who rashly believe everything, who denounce human reason, which is nature's gift to us, who are afraid to judge what is true and what is false, who are as frightened of separating good from evil as infants are of goblins. What are you going to do when a Jew or anyone else aware of this statement asks you why you do not observe the commandments of the law and the prophets? Unquote. Even if one accepts the saying as authentic, it must be interpreted consistently with Jesus' other statements and actions. Faustus makes a close examination of the context of Matthew 5, in order to demonstrate that Jesus responds in two different ways to various laws. Some he affirms and extends, others he rejects. Faustus claims that the affirmed and extended laws are those that are universal to humanity, not among those distinctive to, to, to the Torah, which Jesus rejects. If it was the Jewish laws that Jesus came to fulfill, then only Jews could become Christian since only they would have the original portion that Christ completes. Now, Augustine asks, how can we know what Jesus said unless we rely on the Gospels, since we do not experience Jesus directly? Faustus relies on them for passages he approves of and faults them as defective for passages he rejects. But either they're reliable or they're not. So Augustine, not too comfortable with the way modern biblical scholars freely detect layers of composition within the, uh, within the gospel texts. For him, it's an all or nothing proposition. Either the gospels are reliable sources or they are not. Augustine thinks that nothing noteworthy that Matthew might refer to himself in the third person. After all, he believes Moses wrote the Pentateuch and Moses refers to himself in the third person. Jesus seems to be speaking of himself when he refers to himself in the third person as son of man and so forth. Faustus seems to think that fulfillment means merely carrying out in the literal sense, whereas Augustine insists that fulfillment refers to bringing that literal sense to an end, replacing it with a symbolic sense. He cites a string of passages from Paul that speaks as though the law's purpose is now at an end with its fulfillment in Christ. Hence, Augustine says, the reason why you think that Christ has not fulfilled the prophets, namely that Christians do not do certain things that the prophets instituted for the Hebrews to do, is in fact the proof that he fulfilled them. He who came not to destroy but to fulfill the law and the prophets then abolished by that fulfillment the things which promised the fulfillment of what has now clearly been fulfilled. Just as if he took away these words, will be born, will suffer, and will die, which were rightly uttered when these events were still in the future." Unquote. Surprisingly, Augustine admits that Christ did destroy certain commandments that were seen to be proper to the law of the Hebrews, such as an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. He seems to have abolished this rather than to have affirmed it, he says. But even this destruction is a kind of fulfillment since those laws were rightly instituted for the time up to their abolishment. And Augustine gives a string of such arguments um, along these lines. 
So that's their debate about how to handle the New Testament. But then there's a specific issue within the New Testament and how the New Testament is read between Catholic and Manichaean lines of interpretation. And that's the next point of argument, the human birth of Christ. Faustus objects to Catholic insistence on belief in certain doctrines about Jesus rather than adherence to the instructions of Jesus. Faustus says, you ask me whether I accept the gospel when it is apparent that I do accept it because I observe what it commands. I should rather ask you whether you accept it since in you there is no evident signs of someone who accepts the gospel, unquote. He goes on to directly challenge those who insist that to accept the gospel is, quote, not merely to do what it commands, but also to believe all the things that are written in it, including the birth of Jesus. He contends that Manichaeans have chosen the harder part in living the radical life spelled out in the Sermon on the Mount and elsewhere in the teachings of Jesus, whereas the semi-Christians have contented themselves with believing a few ideas while ignoring Jesus' direct commands. Naturally, he says, people flock to this easy side since they do not know that the kingdom does not consist in words, but in virtue. He mocks the idea that believing that Jesus was born is, quote, more efficacious and better suited for providing salvation for souls than the work of actually following Jesus' uh, ethical uh, instructions. He proceeds to cite several passages in which Christ himself points to deeds as what is crucial for salvation and concludes, you see then that everywhere the kingdom, life, and happiness are promised to my part, which I have chosen for myself from the twofold faith, as you put it, but nowhere are they promised to your part, the part of merely believing rather than doing. Faustus's principal reason for not believing Jesus' human parentage is, quote, that he himself never said that he had a father or a family on earth. On the contrary, he said, he is not of this world, that he came forth from God the Father, that he came down from heaven, that he has no mother or brothers except those who do the will of his Father who is in heaven, unquote. Since the gospel authors were not eyewitnesses to his birth and did not know Jesus as a child, how would they know his genealogy? Quote, in every testimony to the truth, we are always accustomed to ask, whether anyone heard or saw what was reported, unquote. So Faustus is very much taking on the role of someone in a courtroom arguing for the validity of witnesses and pointing out the deficiency of the gospel uh, writers in this regard. In reply, Augustine argues that even if Jesus did not directly speak of his human birth, he referred to himself as son of man, Faustus has cited passages of John that imply Jesus is not human, but the same gospel writer speaks of Jesus as son of man. And in 1 John 4, 3, anyone who does not believe that Christ came in the flesh is an antichrist. How can Faustus argue that gospel writers were not eyewitnesses to Jesus' birth and early life when he accepts John's testimony to Christ's divine preexistence? Was John a witness to that? If Manichaeans reject the reliability of the narrative frame of the Gospels, how can they trust the reliability of their reports of Jesus' words? Manichaean distrust of the Gospel writers generally does not extend to their favorite apostle Paul, but Paul himself includes in his Gospel, what Paul calls his Gospel, my Gospel, the teaching that Jesus was a descendant of David. And in Romans 1.3, he affirms Jesus' descent from David according to the flesh. Now, Faustus has anticipated this last citation. Remember that they're not actually in a live debate. So what Faustus has said, he said without knowing anything that Augustine might say back, but he's anticipated this citation of Paul from Romans. And he proposes that Paul wrote Romans early in Paul's career, before he came to a full understanding of Jesus' divine nature. And Paul seems to allude to this learning curve on his part in 2 Corinthians 5.16 when he says, if we knew Christ according to the flesh, yet now we no longer know him this way, unquote. Suggesting an evolving understanding of Christ. And that's how Faustus sees Paul. So Faustus concludes, if both statements are Paul's, 
Either they will be his for the reason I said that Paul developed in his thinking, or one of them will not be from Paul. In other words, inauthentic interpolation, something of that sort. Paul elsewhere refers to his intellectual and spiritual development. For example, in 1 Corinthians 13, when he says, when a child I spoke like a child, and so forth. But, it is, but Faustus says, if it is not permissible to hold that Paul ever said anything incorrect, then the statement from Romans is not his, but someone else has inserted it into the text. Now, Augustine criticizes the selectivity of Manichaean textual criticism and prefers those who accept or reject whole books or whole testaments rather than pretending reverence for them and then casting doubt on any passage that doesn't agree with them. He faults the Manichaeans for not being able to bring forward any manuscripts that omit the question passages or versions earlier than the Latin version that Faustus and Augustine use in common. So Augustine here at last rhetorically takes the stance of the strictly scientific textual critic, opposing himself to the speculative conjectural emendations of the Manichaeans. Without any objective evidence, how can such conjectures of textual corruption ever be settled when one person can reject one set of passages and another turn around and accept those passages but reject others? Where can one appeal to settle such conflicting claims? Augustine believes in a succession of bishops within the Catholic Church that has safeguarded the authenticity of its texts. He rejects the idea that Paul would ever change his thinking, despite Paul's own apparent rhetorical acknowledgement of such change. Canonical books must be perfect and consistent, Augustine says, so that there is some certain basis for judging other writings. Canonical books must be true in all they say, is, is Augustine's position. So one must try to understand how both statements of Paul can be true. Paul's statement in 2 Corinthians, Augustine suggests, refers to Christ both before and after the resurrection, not to former and later opinion about him in Paul's own mind. But Augustine struggles with Paul's wording, which works against his interpretation. Now some concluding thoughts on the nature of this debate as a whole. There are many more elements we could explore in this lengthy text, but I wanted to focus today on how Manichaeans such as Faustus believed themselves to be true Christians and how they faulted other Christians for what they regarded as certain compromises they had made with social and cultural traditions around them that Jesus himself opposed. The weight of Augustine in our own cultural traditions naturally predisposes someone who picks up the counter Faustum to suppose that Augustine understands Christianity correctly and gets the better of the argument. But that assumption is conditioned by the historical triumph of Augustine's form of Christianity and how that makes sense of Jesus in what has come to seem an obvious way. A major part of the job of a historian is not to let the outcomes of history have the last word on what came before those outcomes were decided. The multitude of modern forms of Christianity makes it very clear that there are any number of ways to make sense of Christianity, to make sense of Jesus and Christianity. And this is not a new phenomenon. From the very beginning, alternative Christianities existed side by side. And I'll talk more about this next week. I will not say they coexisted because they existed in tension and conflict with one another. It is not at all surprising that Augustine could point to things in Manichaean Christianity that he could present as outlandish. The trick to being a historian is to gain the perspective to see how Augustine's Christianity could appear just as outlandish to Faustus. Augustine's Catholic Christianity had selectively forwarded certain aspects of the Christian movement, while Faustus's Manichaean Christianity had pursued others. It is fair to say, I think, that the Manichaeans preserved a certain radical ambivalence about the world inherent in earliest Christianity that they read in terms of a metaphysical conflict between good and evil. Augustine's faith, by comparison, had largely forfeited that dualistic atmosphere as it found a home in the world under God's monarchia. But between such different forms of Christian faith had either lost the essence of that faith that is a theological rather than a historical question. Both Augustine and Faustus provide frames that help to contextualize and define the meaning of Christianity, which is better and which is worse is not really a historical question, but allowing both to be heard is very much a historical value. 
we are in a better position to assess the means by which they each promote and defend their views. The fact is that many of Augustine's biblical interpretations would never be acceptable as a typical modern, at, a, at a typical modern biblical studies conference. Whereas a number of Faustus' suspicions about the biblical text would be right at home. Augustine's wild allegorical re-readings of the Bible are no more outlandish than the Baroque cosmic mythology of the Manichaeans he finds so outrageous. Faustus would not fare so well in a modern biblical studies conference on the question of the relationship of Jesus to Judaism or of the New Testament to the Old. It has been one of the major accomplishments of our field that in the course of the last century, we have reestablished just how essentially Jewish Jesus was. And we have a much richer understanding of both early Christianity and the Jewish context in which it arose than ever before. But Augustine's defense of the value and authority of the Old Testament does not exactly equate with that modern understanding. True, a service impression from the Contra Faustum would pose Augustine in the role of defender of Christianity's links to the Jewish tradition, but only at the expense of the Jewish people and their claims to their own religious heritage. Indeed, their claims even to know the meaning of their own scriptures. By comparison, Faustus's distancing of Christianity from Judaism might first seem quite hostile to Jews but in fact, leaves them largely in peace. He will not claim or appropriate their heritage or reinterpret their scriptures in favor of his own beliefs. He leaves it to them and believes they know what they are talking about when they explicate its meaning, even if he is not attracted to that meaning. Which position then, Augustine's or Faustus's, is really more favorable to the Jews? We know the outcome of Augustine's view in the course of Christian Jewish relations, and it was not good. We can only do a thought experiment to imagine how it might have been different if Faustus and the Manichaeans had prevailed. We cannot change what has been, but, but perhaps such reflections on alternatives gives food for thought about what may yet still be. Thank you.